Thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, great pleasure to be here, and I hope not to disrupt the coffee uh, 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 as it goes along. But uh, I'm mainly here to honor the birthday of Klaus, and I'm very pleased to do so because, well, over the last two decades or so, we have met on and off in various places, in, uh, in Budapest, in, uh, in Cortona, uh, in Paris, and uh, always I enjoyed the interaction between the, the theoretical and the, and the political concerns. And, and in a way, this is an occasion to perhaps briefly revisit some of the, uh, some of the assumptions we, we had when we started thinking about uh, the transitions after, uh, after 1989. Uh, uh, about a year ago, I was uh, uh, at uh, Harvard and was giving a lecture at the Ash Institute, asked to uh, compare Eastern Europe after 1989 and the Arab Spring. And Klaus spotted this on their website or something and immediately said, well, you know, where is your text? Do you have the text? And I said, yes, the text, I will send it to you imminently. It's ready. And I had it ready. It was all there. Parallel with 1989, how quickly dictatorships can collapse. Parallel with 89 and 1848, as you said, you know, the diffusion phenomenon. 1848, you didn't have Twitter. But my God, the speed of diffusion was phenomenal. Uh, so uh, yes, we had. Uh, uh, I had my. Uh, I had my parallels about the fall of dictatorships and, and the speed of change. Uh, I uh, I had my uh, neat comparisons about uh, uh, the uh, uh, Hungary and Tunisia, the most promising cases, small, beautiful, elite, uh, etc. I had, uh, uh, of course, Egypt and Poland, the two most important pivotal countries for the whole uh, region. Of course, then, you know, the dramatic basket case, Romania, Libya, the two dictators fighting it uh, uh, to the last moment. Everything seemed to fall into place, and I was about to send you the text that I still owe you, uh, until I had... Uh, uh, a lunch with an Egyptian uh, a gentleman at the, at the Kennedy School called Tariq Massoud, who said, yeah, no, no, it was all very interesting. It is very good. Uh, but, uh, you know, if you really want to understand transition uh, in, in our part of the world, uh, um, because I was asking him what to read, you know, uh, I was avidly reading everything. I, he said, you should start with novels. And he gave me a few hints, you know, start with Alaswani, you know, the Yakubian building, etc. And he gave me a few things. And then he said, and don't rush it, you know. Wait for the elections. Wait for the constitution, etc. I uh, followed his uh, advice. I therefore didn't deliver to Klaus the, the promised <laughs> piece. And in a way... I am now probably glad I, did, I didn't because I might be perhaps slightly embarrassed uh, 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 about what I uh, uh, would have uh, uh, written then. But, uh, you know, these are about the traps of not wanting to apply the methodological imperialism of East Europeanists to the Middle East, uh, just as Latin Americanists did to Eastern Europe some, uh, uh, some 20 years before. So... Um, uh, this is, uh, uh, yeah, about how uh, we, uh, uh, um, the, the, yeah, the difficulty of uh, applying to new situations concepts you've derived from other circumstances. This, I think, has been the main problem with transitology. It is much safer to do, to look back with a 20 years hindsight. You know, you said we have three main goals, democracy, uh, market, Europe. This was... Uh, the, the common mantra, this was uh, the goal. Well, you know, 20 years after, well, democracy is fatigued, tired, exhausted. The market <laughs> is in crisis as well. And Europe itself, the destination, is in crisis. So the triple goal has been achieved wonderfully. And the triple goal, just as it was achieved, has witnessed 
the major crisis uh, since 2008. So, you know, the cycle has been fulfilled and thoroughly exhausted uh, 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 with uh, all the questions about where, where to go from, from there. Um, uh, in, in, in looking back at what we uh, thought then and, and uh, what was likely to... I uh, remember uh, uh, Klaus's uh, uh, contribution to that debate. Uh, I remember two, two important things. One was that I think he was the first, or perhaps among the first, who very early on pointed out that you, you need not just the political transition to democracy, not just the market as a, or uh, civil society building. You needed also uh, the fourth transition. You needed the state, especially from federal. If you if you are in a federal state, you have there the question of stateness, and you cannot have a successful transition to democracy unless you have a consensus on the territorial framework of that democracy. And we have seen, of course, in the Soviet Union and mainly in Yugoslavia, that this was a major cause for the derailment of the democratic transition. So I think this was a very important insight. And uh, well, Ivan and myself, we've devoted quite a lot of time since then to looking at uh, uh, the consequences of that. Uh, territorial question for, 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 for the democratic uh, transition. But there was another uh, insight. Uh, I think it was in the, uh, uh, you know, let's say, ship, uh, rebuilding the ship at sea. And there was, uh, but not just Klaus, many people then and uh, uh, were wondering whether it would be possible to uh, move to democracy in a context where at the same time you administer the society a phenomenal shock of the market transition, that you create such disruption, such hardship, that it is unlikely for democracy to prosper in such conditions. And there were people like Adam Przeworski, et cetera, who then wrote, you know, the likely future of Eastern Europe is not Western Europe, it's Latin America. And the Latin American comparison uh, he made. I remember even a conversation with Bronislav Geremek, who said, you know, unless we, there is a Marshall Plan for Eastern Europe, we may be heading not west, but south, and things like that. So this was, at the time, the assumption that to carry the two things at the same time, the two transitions, was a very uh, uh, difficult and perhaps unlikely uh, proposition. So the question is, why? Uh, uh, why that, uh, uh, let's say, apprehension or pessimistic scenario didn't materialize. Um, Ivan alluded to this by mentioning the, the politic of, uh, political economy of, of patience. So in a way, uh, 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 all I can add very briefly to that is, uh, if we look for explanation, you have a very strong uh, uh, democratic legitimacy in the governments who are imposing this transformation. No other government under other circumstances, only after the fall of a dictatorship that lasted decades, you can introduce something, uh, something like that. You know, the free market introduced under the banner of a trade union called Solidarity. <laughs> that will not be repeated, I think, anytime, anytime soon. Uh, second, you have the endurance of societies. Uh, uh, last week, the, the governor of the Polish Central Bank was in Paris, and at, uh, uh, at a discussion with him, uh, somebody was asked, but how is it possible that a country, you know, like uh, Latvia, etc., that they were prepared to uh, ha accept, you know, to, to survive a drop in real income by 25% uh, uh, in one year, a quarter of their income? He says, well... He thought, he says, well, you know, in a country where a quarter of the population had been deported to Siberia, you can accept a drop in real income in one year. Okay, I, I, I wouldn't want to push uh, uh, the argument too far, but there was this idea that you have resilience, endurance of these societies, their adaptability, one of the legacies of communism. Uh, uh, yes, you had no civil society to speak of, but you have great... Adaptability, well, sociologists have said that, that I think is, is part of the uh, explanation. And finally, uh, the absence of social actors. You know, no trade union, no organized labor, no nothing. 
and you have an atomized society, and you can, you, you can just do it. And, 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 and it worked for those, uh, the, those who did it there. And you didn't have a Marshall Plan, like Bronislav, as Bronislav Geremek was suggesting, but you had uh, a massive uh, arrival of FDI, uh, uh, at least in Hungary, uh, Czech, Czechoslovakia, and, and, and Poland in the, in, in the 1990s. So these are, these are some of the explanations or, or attempts to, to explain uh, uh, why the transition to the market and democracy uh, 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 could go in parallel. I say in parallel because I have great reluctance uh, to lump the two things together, as was very often done. You remember the notion of market democracies. We have to uh, uh, transition to market democracy, promotion of market democracies, all that uh, uh, um, uh, uh, rhetoric, and basically the wish to abolish the distinction between political and economic liberalism. Uh, Václav Klaus and Václav Havel, the same thing. Both want to dismantle the power of the state, one because he wants individual freedom and human rights, the other because he wants free markets, but basically they uh, converge in wanting to weaken or dismantle uh, 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 the, uh, the state. So. Uh, you lump together and you have this concept of uh, market democracy, uh, which then, in its more uh, optimistic versions, was combined with ideas of, uh, uh, well, not only we get global markets, but we get global governance, global democratic governance, global human rights promotions, uh, global civil society, Mary Caldor was writing, and things like that. Well, uh, we, we know what happened to that. Uh, so uh, uh, instead of all these global uh, uh, civil, uh, civil, civil society, global governance, etc., we, we've got global rise of authoritarian capitalism. And, and uh, at least in, 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 this, uh, consider, in, in, in Russia, China, etc. And they are, uh, I think, the answer to uh, some of the... Uh, uh, some of the uh, 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 proponents of the market democracy concept. Then the second, um, uh, second assumption after market democracy was uh, uh, the European Union as a destination. You, cons you have a transition to democracy, you consolidate democracy, and that leads you straight into the European Union, which is supposed to make uh, 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 new democracies, uh, uh, new uh, Eastern European uh, uh, countries safe for, uh, safe for democracy. So this, this idea of Europe's uh, uh, transformative uh, power, uh, that as the most effective way to consolidate those democracies. Europeanization, as it became known suddenly, this is another of these bizarre concepts, uh, uh, market democracy, Europeanization, as it became known, uh, 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 the supreme stage of the transition, uh, uh, that became sort of a huge uh, academic industry and uh, 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 flourishing until, until, uh, until recently. Uh, but, then there is a big but. What if the EU itself, under the pressure of the global markets, is facing centrifugal tendencies? What if the pressures of those markets contribute to undermine not just the economic prospects, the social fabric, but the very legitimacy of democratic institutions inside the EU? The two dominant responses to the crisis uh, has been, as Klaus uh, this morning has already indicated, both technocracy and populism, both combining in undermining uh, uh, the democratic substance of, uh, uh, in the EU. Uh, to be sure, the more established democracies, uh, British, uh, French, German, etc., on the whole have managed so far to contain the trend. But nevertheless, we are witnessing the erosion of the EU as a democratizing constraint on its old and new members. So, after how long do you cease to be a young democracy? The answer is when you suffer from the same ills as the old ones. And there is no shortage of shared symptoms of democratic fatigue in what Ramsfeldians used to call old and new Europe. Uh, not surprisingly, because after 1989, the East Europeans 
promptly abandoned, discarded all the legacies of their rethinking of democracy that they had through the dissident experience and went for the uh, uh, imitation of the Western democratic model. No experiments was the motto of the day, but of course, if you imitate a model in crisis, not surprisingly, you end up sharing its basic features. This was something I think Jürgen Habermas uh, pointed to, I mean, in, in 1989 uh, about the uh, catching up revolution. Well, uh, uh, I think it, it, it had this uh, democratic snag. It was certainly a shortcut to a number of things, but it, 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 had, it had an inbuilt, it had an inbuilt snag in it. So the current economic and financial and democratic crisis is a trans-European one and should be treated as such. The countries of East Central Europe provide an interesting insight into the nature and the diffusion of that. And I, uh, all I can do in the limited time that is uh, left to me is uh, uh, to address a point, uh, a third sort of uh, remark or, or observation about the transitology, which used to have a sort of very neat theological uh, perspective, you know, transition uh, 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 to democracy, then consolidate democracy, then you anchor it into the European uh, uh, Union, etc. Uh, well, uh, what we're witnessing re recently is not only uh, the, uh, what I just alluded to, the erosion of the democracy, but even explicit regression. So we, you can have transition, consolidation, and regression. <laughs> and we are now, witnessing, really, the uh, disturbing aspects of transition, not exactly backwards, maybe it is sideways, call it whatever you want, but it certainly, Hungary is, is the most, uh, I think, explicit case uh, we have in mind. And again, Hungary is interesting because it was a transitologist teacher pet. You know, this was, this was, this was the favorite. I mean, it had everything. It had the negotiated uh, transition among elites. Uh, uh, well, guess what? It became the most polarized. It, had de it has now de facto a sort of cold civil war uh, 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 in, in Budapest. It, was, uh, it had anticipated all the market uh, reforms already before the fall of communism. That was supposed to be, you know, the past dependencies, the advantage of all the reformism. Well, guess what? This is a country that has now the biggest problem with the uh, international market, is nationalizing <laughs> pension funds, banks, etc. So this is a... And uh, 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 thirdly, this was a country that um, gave priority to constitutionalism over constitutions. In, in other words, amending constitution, the, the old existing constitution. I remember the, the, the Hungarian professor Shayo saying, you know, the Hungarian constitution has been amended beyond recognition. All that is left of the old constitution is a sentence, Budapest is the capital of Hungary. <laughs> uh, uh, so the idea was keep the old constitution, you amend it, and that process of amendment constitutionalism is more important than drafting a brand new constitution itself because that process brings all the main political actors to internalize uh, 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 the norms of the constitution and uh, uh, it transforms the political culture uh, 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 in the same process. And this is what you need. Without that transformation of the political culture, uh, the institutions and the constitution will be empty, empty shells. Well, guess what? We have 20 years after uh, a new constitution in Hungary adopted by parliament, 350 new laws adopted in a year and a half, more than 30 new constitutional law. In other words, teacher's pet be completely flunked it. Uh, uh, it, it, it. Hungary is not the model. It is, in fact, the uh, embodiment of what can, of that slide, of that regression from, indeed, a democratically elected government that has a two-thirds majority in parliament, slides into uh, illiberalism, uh, 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 abolishing uh, separation of power, controlling the media. I don't give you the full list of what is happening there. But what is therefore interesting is the transition the other way around. You know, it was about five years ago, my uh, uh, colleague and friend Pierre Hasner wrote a, an article about the transition to autocracy in Russia. Well, uh, uh, here you have, you know, the, 
transition moving the other way towards some kind of hybrid regime. This is not yet full-fledged authoritarianism, but you have within democracy, through a democratic parliament, you have a gradual erosion of the separation of power of the basic ingredients of the rule of law. So you can then look at Hungary, both as a magnifying glass to the crisis of democracy within Europe as a whole, the trans-European dimension, the rise of authoritarian nationalist populist movements we can see elsewhere throughout the Europe. But you can also see it as a bridge to what is happening further east. Hungary, milder version of authoritarianism. Ukraine, under, under uh, Yanukovych, already a, a much tougher slide into authoritarianism. Putin for the East going, giving you the full works. So you have there an authoritarian axis, and I see that I have run out of time. Central Europe, and Hungary in particular, therefore, as a bridge in both directions, magnifying glass to what is happening inside the EU with the crisis of democracy, but also an inside. And therefore, you have behind the question of democracy, that is at least how it is perceived in Budapest by my all dissident friends, they see it as a geopolitical stakes. This question of democracy is not just, uh, and the rule of law, is not just an academic uh, discussion. For them, it is a geopolitical stake. If I'm saying this is an insight into both trends, well, which one is it going to be? <laughs> and uh, so this is at least how it is uh, uh, perceived. So uh, the good news, to conclude, the good news for everybody is that democracy has made spectacular progress in places where we didn't expect it and where there was none before. In the Arab Middle East, the demonstrations in Russia in December, you can, you can, you can list if you are optimistic, that would be. Uh, the bad news is democracy is not doing well in places where it was firmly established. So the, uh, to, to return to Klaus's uh, 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 shipbuilding uh, metaphor, so we have, we have the ship uh, which is leaking we constantly water. Okay. We are constantly pouring the water out. Uh, there is no, uh, there is no chance we can ever succeed. It is a Sisyphus task, but there is no other option. There is no better option that we have inside. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much.